hi everyone and and welcome to this uh to this conversation uh it's going to be a good one i think uh i'm jeffrey goldberg i'm the editor-in-chief of the atlantic and i want to welcome deb and jim fallows my uh colleagues stalwart Atlantic journalists. Uh, and I also want to welcome uh, the great filmmakers, uh, Steve Asher and Jeannie Jordan, the people who turned Jim and Deb's book, Our Town's 100,000 Mile Journey into the Heart of America, into a brilliant documentary. And I could say that it's brilliant because I actually watched it. Um, and this documentary will be premiering shortly on on HBO, and we're all very excited about that. Jim and Deb, you obviously know, Jim Fallows has been a writer for The Atlantic for, I won't name the number of decades, but it's more than two. <laughs> the book uh, and the documentary, uh, th these were born at The Atlantic, um, sort of happened organically. Um, I remember several years ago, uh, you know, asking people, where's, where's Jim? And somehow he was always <laughs> flying a small, dangerous airplane to Sheboygan. Um, it always seemed like Sheboygan or a town like Sheboygan. And and what was, was, was going on is that Jim and Deb were setting out to explore America beneath or beyond the headlines, uh, beyond the social media maelstrom, cable news polarization, to see if it's possible to renew our country and see what was happening um, on the ground. Um, and the easiest way to get to all these different grounds was by by air in this small rickety airplane that you'll see in the, in the film. Um, one of the remarkable thing, I'm not even doing shtick and you're laughing. Uh, these are all true things that I'm saying. The remarkable thing about the book um, and the documentary is that they're not about Donald Trump. They barely says anything about Donald Trump or the, the sort of hot button polarizing issues that people talk um, so much about. Just one note about the, the film uh, and my genuine enthusiasm for it. Watching it felt like the opposite of doom scrolling or watching cable news. Um, it's not Pollyanna-ish. It deals with America's problems as they are. It's, it's. I, I think uh, Jim and or Deb and or Steve and Jeannie have all referred to this in some ways as sort of reality-based optimism. Um, it's, um, it's a quiet, quietly mesmerizing uh, film and also beautiful. And I, and I hope that everybody in America watches it. But let me just start um, with, uh, with Deb and Jim. Um, you know, I, I wanted, to, I want to know, and I think our audience would want to know what you were setting out to do when you started flying around the country. What, what is the thing that you were looking for? Or did you even know what you were looking for? And then we could jump to, to, to how the, how it became a book and then how it became this uh, amazing documentary. So Jeff, thanks so much for all of your, uh, your gracious support over the years and, and through this film. And we, we really appreciate it and everything you've done to, to make this, this possible. Um, as you and I have discussed, Jeff, over the years, the joy of reporting is what you don't know until you show up. And so when we were starting to do this, these travels back in 2013, we'd been in China for a long time and we're just trying to sort of re-acculturate ourselves to, to the U.S. And we'd known from our previous long span of flying this little airplane around the country for the record, there's a parachute for the whole plane should anything <laughs> go wrong. It's, it's, uh, we just learned how many surprising things there were. You'd end up in some place like Rock Springs, Wyoming, or Demopolis, Alabama, and see all this life going on there. So we started in 2013 just saying, what is it like if you go to places that aren't normally in the news and, and what, what is going on there? And just the, the main impulse we were trying to convey in, in hundreds of Atlantic posts and some articles is how much there is there. You know, the opposite of Gertrude Stein on, on Oakland, there's no there there. This was, there is there, there all over the place. And cumulatively, we, start, we started to see some patterns. So we didn't know what we were looking for, but there was a lot of it when we got there. And Deb, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but this this started before the the the, the Trump, or the thinking at least started before the Trump era. You were interested in these questions uh, without regard to the, the, all the splits and the anxieties and anger that sort of erupted in this country. Is that correct? Absolutely, that's correct. This started in 2013, which seems like a lot more than eight years ago. Um, this, this was a whole different administration. It was a whole different tone in the country. And we deliberately went out not to ask any kind of political questions of any administration that we had gone through during that time, but rather to ask people about what life was like in their hometowns. That was what was really interesting to us, to see what they felt about how things were going post-recession and how they were dealing with 
uh, things that had gone wrong in their communities or things that they would want to fix and how they work together. Um, and just a, a sense what we, you're right about saying that this was an organic process. It, it's so hard to take ourselves back, you know, practically a decade into what the world was like then. But it, it was something that grew and played out. And uh, as Jim said, we, we discovered patterns, but we also discovered the uniqueness of every single town, which is what Steve and Jeannie <laughs> helped capture from words into film. Right, right. Let, let me let me ask um, Steve and Jeannie, um, and either one of you take take this question. But when you when you read the articles and then read the book, what 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 did you see in this that made you think that you could pull together all of these strands into a coherent documentary? Well, it's interesting because when we were hired to, you know, HBO came to us and said, "Here's this book. Would you like to make a film?" We didn't conceive of it exactly as making the book into a movie as much as we saw this. It was a whole process that had started with the blog post that became the America Futures series in the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. And then that became a book. And then we were kind of taking that process and transforming it into kind of cinematic terms, which isn't the same as, you know, making a, you know, translating a book. Um, so we, we knew that we needed to experience new things that hadn't been seen in the book. And that also that the motor of film is different than the motor of nonfiction prose and that we needed to add a lot of other elements that may, would hopefully make it cinematic. I'd also say that one thing that really spoke, spoke to us was that the fact that I, I grew up in a small town near a small town in Iowa. The way that the book captures the one on one of this country uh, which is where really where things happen was is so striking to us. And we were really excited to think, think that we could, you know, show that in the film. And I, I feel like we really have. How did you balance um, the, I guess, you know, that reality based optimism or whatever you want to call it um, with the obvious, especially as you're making this film over the last couple of years, with the sort of the obvious stresses that are taking place, all, all the fracturing that seemed to be taking place across the country. How did you how did you think about this material in light of a reality that wasn't, um, you know, can do, we have more that unites us than divides us kind of spirit in the country at the moment? I would say, you know, we, we did not set out to make a positive film in that sense. That was not the, the goal. The goal was to capture real darkness and real efforts to kind of counteract that dark darkness and see those forces in play. We felt it was really important that the film show you what's wrong and see people that are trying to work on th things, which ranged from individual action to community action. Uh, but we definitely did not want to make a Pollyanna-ish or Booster-ish film that's about, you know, just good things. It's about people who are struggling and finding solutions. But uh, that tension had to be in the film. What are the things that surprised you as you yourselves were moving around the country with them? I, I would really say that the thing that came out in the book and very much we found as we started trying to make the film and reaching out is how much people wanted to help us make it, how mm. open people were, how much everyone felt that their town was a best kept secret of some sort. And um, I, I, I guess I wasn't really expecting that. I thought that it was going to be a hard slog. It was a hard slog, but people were so helpful and generous about giving us hints about what to look at and what, what really captured their towns. I think we're all very atomized, and I think the pandemic has exacerbated that. And it was astonishing to go to these communities where people really saw themselves as part of a community and trying to work on things in a collective way that, uh, you know, a lot of people don't experience living in cities or uh, you know, even in small towns sometimes. So the, the, the idea that there were people that kind of thought about their town as a whole and were thinking about what they could do to, to affect its trajectory, that was really in, amazing. I'm curious to know why you thought people were so helpful. Was it just because Americans are actually nice and want to be helpful? Um, was it because they really felt a kind of pride in their 
community or some of the efforts that were going on? Well, I, I wouldn't say that it's all about Americans being nice. Um, you know, Americans are so individualistic that you could never you could never choose one word for them. But I do think that that people in these towns were deeply curious and interested um, as are Jim and Deb. So there was this way that it felt to me like they wanted to tell this story with us well. It, it wasn't even like they were trying to get to know filmmakers or trying to get to know authors. It was very much like we were coming to, and asking them, tell us what your town is like, and they really wanted to. Um, and they weren't, people weren't always nice, um, but they definitely helped us. And, and, and the, I think, that, and as you see in the Eastport section, you know, there's a sense that people in cities or people on coast tend to kind of in smaller uh, area, places where there's less density. And people are as sophisticated in small towns as they are in large cities. And they're just as connected to world events. And um, people wanted to show who they were. Going to that same question um, from our point of view, I think that um, one thing is really important. People like to talk about themselves. And if you're interested and ask them a question about themselves, they will talk and they will open up and appreciate that someone is interested and has have a ch and give you the chance to talk about yourself. Um, and th then I think since we started off talking about the local places, the communities where people actually live day to day, morning to night, that was what they focused on. And and you know, from our perspective here in Washington D.C., I, I think it's easy to take that question and run it down a national road and talk about the state of the nation. But when you're in a, a small community, people talk about the state of their community with a sense of passion and pride and don't immediately, or sometimes even ever, go to the, the kind of split and bifurcation between national and local. It is about the local. And if you start there, that's where it goes. And to to segue in my turn here, I'll, I'll connect to something that Deb said. There are a number of riffs in this film which tell the audience more about me than they might want to know or that I might have wanted to tell over the years. One of which is part of the reason I love being a reporter is that by nature, I am so introverted that I just sit in the closet all day. And But being a reporter is sort of the, uh, well, <laughs> but of course, with my beloved wife, yeah. as I've been doing for the last, last year with the pandemic. But, you know, being a reporter is a structural way to get people to tell you their story. And the connection to your question is that when people are telling their stories, they're interesting and they're nuanced and they see the complexity and they see the hope and the tragedy and they see the things that are their fault and the things that are not their fault and they could control or not. And the the connection here is if you ask people about national politics, usually you get none of that three dimensionality. You get the, oh, these people are socialists, these people are fascists. And it just is something about the nature of engagement with national politics has made it just like a cable news panel, as opposed to the richness of most people's stories in most communities. And that, that was what was attracting us for the um, the patriotism quotient now. Uh, as you know, Jeff, because the Atlantic's written about it over its its history, and we we discussed it. I think the story of America is always being in crisis, always being embattled, always being on the precipice of getting to some some huge um, problem. And the capacity to me, American patriotism is the struggle. It is the effort to reinvent. It is thinking that there can be a better possibility. And so, a lot of these communities. That was the underlying story. A lot of them are having really uh, hard times, but they thought we can figure out something to do. And that, that was a kind of Americanness that, that I recognized and connected with. Steve, Jeannie, what, you deliberately elide politics in, in this documentary, which on one hand maybe is a, is a bold marketing choice because we know that there's a built-in audience for yelling and discord. Um, but talk, talk about, talk about how you managed to do this without, um, politics. I mean, and, and I guess, I guess another way of noting this is that I am sure that some of the people who are interviewed in the, in the, in the film, in the documentary are Trump supporters. Others might've been Biden supporters or Hillary supporters going back a ways. Um, but we don't know. 
Well, we, we really took our cue from Jim and Deb in the book um, because they didn't do that. And actually, that was the thing that impressed us the most about the book is that it it did not go to that place that everybody was starting to go to when when they started writing it. And I, I have to say that going on the road with them and going into communities and not talking about politics was like going on a vacation. It really <laughs> was. I mean, really, I mean, things were so fraught all the time. We would not be able to watch the news every night. We would not be able to keep connected to because we were way too busy. And you become kind of part of the community and realize it didn't really matter what was happening. It, 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 it was just here and now. And I, I enjoyed it very much and never had any temptation and did not feel that people wanted to talk about it. Yeah. I mean, in all of our work, one of the things that we really try to do is kind of, kind of upend cliches or subvert them in some way. And if you knew the political identification of somebody in the film, you'd immediately impose on them your pre-existing view of what those kind of people are like. And we really wanted people to, to as much as possible, identify with who's in the film, see what they're doing, and then you try to guess who's conservative and who's progressive because you're, a lot of times you'd be wrong. I'm guessing that that there are that there are people in the film who, if you actually had a cable news style discussion with, you would kind of get really angry at. But you also seem to like the people you're dealing with. So, like, how did you how, did you learn something about people who say support Trump that you otherwise might not have understood had you not gone on the road like this? So, yes. And I'll, I'll give you this sort of the journalistic motivation for doing um, approaching this the way we did and then sort of the human revelation. The journalistic motivation is I feel there's been a two dimensionality or one dimensional flatness imposed upon our understanding of the country by having so much of it reduced to is this a red state or a blue state? Did this precinct, was it swinging from Obama to Trump or, or vice versa? How are they voting You know, in, in the next national election because at any time in American history, that's been oversimplifying. And right now, it's both oversimplifying and dramatically polarizing and sort of uh, brutalizing. You know, you think that people are associated with the worst of, of the national level political extremes. And so, as I was mentioning before, um, I don't think I've ever learned anything interesting by asking somebody in South Dakota or Kansas or Mississippi their views of national politics. But I always learn something interesting about the Mississippi School of Math and Science or what refugees are doing in Sioux Falls or how Charleston, West Virginia is having its its uh, its felon labor program to kind of rehabilitate people and rehabilitate neighborhoods. So it was just journalistically um an opportunity, a target-rich environment, as we say, journalistically. There's so many things that were, hey, look at this. This is surprising. And then in terms of the of the, the human lessons, I grew up in a town that was very right-wing, that went for Goldwater. I've, I've been, you know, I've seen the complexities of people who I would disagree with on national politics, but recognize in all the other parts of their life, we find uh, much in common. So, um this was sort of a, a confirmation that even as national politics was becoming so poisonous, there was all this, that wasn't the entire fabric of American life. It was an important part of the fabric, but not the only fabric. Believe it or not, I, even though I've lived the last more than two decades in Washington, <laughs> D.C., I'm not a political person. And that, like, I'm kind of swimming upstream against it all the time. So it was a real relief to me to be back in my natural milieu of small towns and small communities around the country. Um, there was nothing, I never felt there was anything contrived about the way we approached this reporting and kind of more evidence to the absence of national um, uh, preoccupation with politics. Here's something that has been very interesting for me, at least in the last year. I was kind of quasi invited to, to be on Zoom calls weekly or twice weekly with basically the entire state of South Dakota for the last 13 months. And it was people from small towns around South Dakota who were in, 
in who came to economic development from various different perspectives, some from the economy or leadership or the arts or education. And I am here to report that I'm struggling to come up with any conversation in that that was political. Um, from two dozen people, two dozen communities around South Dakota talking about South Dakota in a non-political, apolitical way. So that it's, I think that's something I offer to you, not just from the four of us, but from the state of South Dakota. When you start talking about what's going on there, that's the way the conversation went for the last year. And that's why you're announcing your candidacy here today for governor of South Dakota. Is that correct? Is that the <laughs> next? I expect to win too, right? I, yeah. I just feel I'm like that we're moving in that. Yeah. Jim and Deb, how did you find places that stood for things that you wanted to illustrate? And then for the filmmakers, it's how did you boil it down even more? So it was very organic and happenstance when we started doing things for the Atlantic. We, we, um, I, I, as I mentioned in the film, I did a blog post back in early 2013 saying we're looking for story for places that have an interesting story, places that are underrepresented in the national media landscape and have been through some kind of problem where there's an interesting story. And as I say in the film, we got a thousand replies that which kept in coming over the, um, the subsequent years. And so we just sort of felt our way around the map. Starting out in South Dakota, then we went, I think, to uh, Industrial Michigan, then we went to Burlington, Vermont, and then we're going down to the South when it got uh, colder. And just over the course of about three and a half years of doing this, with half the time for about three and a half years, just seeing where have we not been that we need to go see. Uh, there's a map in the frontispiece of our book which shows places we went, and there's one missing zone, which is the Rocky Mountain Zone having to do with small airplanes as our means of transit. So I figured we go to, to the, the lowlands, not uh, these high altitude airstrips. Yeah, your friends are thankful that you didn't try to, to pull that one off <laughs> in that particular airplane. I just wanted to say that the, the choosing of the towns, as you can imagine, it was pretty daunting because there were so many. But one of the, one of the things that was clear is there are certain towns Jim and Deb had kept, kept returning to, Eastport, Eastport, Maine, Columbus, Mississippi. Those immediately jumped out. Like we wanted to see why, uh, why they kept going there, and and we wanted to go there with them. Then there were towns that they hadn't been to quite as much. Charleston, uh, they had just been to once, I believe. That that we thought then we would all experience it for in a kind of new way and find stories in a new way. So it, it was. What really was interesting to me is about so much about this process is that the four of us thought so much alike that we had no trouble uh, finding the towns. We didn't decide them all at once. We, As we kept going, we thought of maybe this town would be a good, but we, we never, it was fairly easy to choose the towns, um, which it really amazed me. And, and the winnowing process was not just about where we went, but what we filmed and ultimately what's in the film, because we filmed a lot more yeah. stories. And the kind of challenge of this film was to tell very short, have very short vignettes together in this kind of pointillistic way that would somehow feel like a flow and felt like it was integral. And, uh, you know, you meet people for a very short amount of time, but hopefully you get a vivid impression of them. And that, that took a long time in the editing room to make that happen. It was an incredible experience to, um, to go to these places where we knew people, where we had been before, and to see it through the eyes of, of our cameras, of Jeannie and Steve, that um, we learned how action-oriented things needed to be. Like we could write thousands of words and somehow, this had to be captured in a few seconds of a very vital act activity and action, whether it was a circus in Redlands, California, or a cowboy in Bend, Oregon. And it, it was amazing to see how, how the same processes that we went through of trying to find the heart and soul of what we were reporting came out in such different ways, either this, you know, flurry of words or this beautiful segmentation and and then adaptation and then compilation of onto film. Um, I we had I have to say we had so much fun. Um, we I, I'm only sad that it's over. I'd love to do it again. 
I mean, this was just kind of a magical collaboration for the four of us. What problem did you see in, in what place that made you think, huh, this, this doesn't seem surmountable. It's great that they're putting their shoulders into it, but this is, whether it's opioid, whether it's racial division, uh, I mean, there's a lot in the, there's a lot in the, in the, in the, in the film, obviously, but what's, what's the thing that actually got you down? Yeah, right. uh, opioids, opioids. Uh, opioids and addiction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, uh, that's um, a giant problem. And, and of course, there's the pressure on really small towns, which we saw in different ways in, in Eastport, Maine, and to Charleston, West Virginia, certain uh, distinction. So there's pressure on really small towns. There is opioids, I guess opioids, and there's, the, of course, the historical burden of race that we talk about in many of these places, too. But the opioids felt more like an uphill struggle every single day. And you see that in the film. It, it just, it kind of makes you want to cry and also be proud at the same time of the people who are trying. The, the racial history, I, I for one feel like there is more um, activity and forward motion that's coming from the towns in Mississippi, where this is at the epicenter. Um, that gives me more hope, easy for me to say, but um, I feel that. I just wanted to say the opioid problem, the op opioid problem in America was, you know, we all know about it. What really was striking, I think for all of us was to realize when it happens to you, when it's in your life, when you see it up close, you know that something has to be done about it, that it is really tragic and enormous. When you have never experienced anything about it, uh, you don't, it feels far away. So we felt uh, privileged to be kind of in the center of it, like in Charleston and to meet the Pulitzer Prize winning writer who wrote uh, the, the, the article that really blew it open, um, Eric Ayer, his name is, but we, I think we all learned that this was something that has, to, something has to be done about this. Let me stay with you two for a last question, because uh, obviously our Atlantic audience is very familiar with um, Jim and Deb, which is wonderful for our Atlantic audience. Um, you're newer to this. And so I wanted to just ask you. In reading Jim and Deb and then going out on the road yourselves, um, what positive change? occurred to you in your own mind and your own understanding uh, of America and its future? I mean, I, I think a lot about this in the context of balkanization, uh, you know, regional strife, interracial strife and all the rest. Uh, tell us something positive you learned about the trajectory of this country that you did not know before you paired up with with Deb and Jim. Well, I think Jim's the, the line that Jim alluded to that's in the film about, you know, the country's always been in trouble and it's always been getting itself out of trouble. And that was kind of a credo for shaping the film, the, the trouble that it's been in and the trouble that it's pulling itself out of. And you feel those forces in so many different ways. I mean, if you've seen the film, you know all the different kinds of ways people are doing this on different scales. And, you know, so... You can't feel really optimistic about the arc of history, but you can see that it's striving really hard. And that was just very vivid in every town we went. I, I think for me, I, we went into this really almost depressed about what is going on around us. Um, it, it just, it, it was just too much. And it was a relief, as I said, to get away from it. But it reaffirmed something that I knew growing up, um, which is that one-on-one -on -one people will help each other. People care about each other. It is, it's, it's true. It's there. There's nothing Pollyannish about it. And to have that reaffirmed because it had started to feel like maybe that stopped being true, but it hasn't. Um, we all know that the secret motivation for Jim on this 100,000 mile journey was to find <laughs> the best small brewery in America. So where's the best, where's the best beer? Everybody knows this. So, so let me ask you, Jeff, who is your favorite child? <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> Come on, it's not. I don't think. I don't think. I don't think craft beer is the equivalent of our children. But okay, if you want to go down that road, question you can't answer. <laughs> it's it's great talking to all, all, all of you. Um, don't forget to vote for Deb for governor, uh, even if you don't live in South Dakota. <laughs> And then you're absolutely Thanks. ballot. Um, I, I just wanted to say in, in, in closing that um, when I and I think I mentioned this to some combination of you when I watched this for the first time, I felt like this this um, this is a, a film for the 80 percent, um, meaning, you know, the people on the extremes who are demonizing their opponents um, and who probably spend too much time in front of TV or down Internet uh, rabbit holes. Maybe it's not for them, but for the rest of us who uh you know, see the problems, but also believe that that there are solutions to these problems. This is a this is a is a great thing for people to to watch. It's obviously a great book for people to read. Uh, and so I want to thank all four of you for for doing this. And please remember to watch Our Towns April 13th on HBO. And of course, it's streaming on HBO Max. And, and thank you again for for joining us.